Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and today I'm with Victor Aviscal of Vines on the Merry Crest in Paso Robles. Victor, welcome. Tell us about Vines on the Merry Crest. Hi, Allison. Thanks for having us. Um, we, Happy to have you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> We're a little mom and pop shop in uh, Western Paso Robles. Um, we've been around since uh, we moved here from Los Angeles in 2004, and we've been a commercial winery since 2005. Uh, we own 26 acres here on the west side, um, and uh, a compound or, or, or a, a, a space, a place originally owned by the Surrett family. Uh, Richard Surrett fame, very famous grower around these parts, and so we bought this property uh, from their trust, uh, the Surrett family trust, and uh, so that was way back in '04, and we've been uh, babbling ever since. So, <laughs> and uh, so you said you have 24 acres, 26, 26, all planted. What grapes do you have planted here? Um, we have about 17 acres planted. I, I, I plan on doing just a little bit more than that, but because I do everything myself and we don't have employees or anything, and, and it's just my wife and I, um, it's a little more than I can handle as it is. So, um, But I, I'm kind of dying to plant some, uh, some other varietals uh, that I'm currently buying from people that, that I really want to just grow myself. So I'll, I might get it up to 19 or something like that, but I don't think it'll ever be pulled up. Even though it, it deserves to be, it just won't be. Yeah, and what are the grapes you're growing here? Um, we grow all the red, the prominent red rones, so Grenache, Cunois, Sanso, Morved, and a, and a fair bit of Syrah. Um, we have a field blend, which is just behind you there, uh, which is a Tempranillo-based field blend. <clears throat> it, uh, but it, it's, it's four varietals on one little spot, one little two-acre spot. is Tempranillo, Cabernet Sauvignon, Carignan, and Grenache, and that just makes one wine for us. And then we have our old Zin in the back, planted by the Surrett family. It's one of the oldest in the region. It was planted what we believe to be in 1963, which... Hey there. <laughs> even even they, yeah, the they, clock they, agrees. they think I'm crazy. <laughs> And don't even ask me what that is because I don't even know. But uh, that was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna happen. So anyway, we got this old Zin that was there. Was well, the only thing here when we started. So we we, we basically bought an 80 year old almond orchard uh, where there were thousands of trees on this property, and then this teeny little Zinfandel in the back. And that's sort of what we the horse we jumped on when we when we started. So uh, that's one of the oldest Zin plots in mm -hmm. the region. And white grapes. Uh, none. No. no. We, uh, we make a different white wine every year, so we never replicate the same white wine two years in a row, so we can do that because we don't, we, we can just... Buy what you want. Yeah, buy what we want and decide what we want to do, and that way we're, we're nimble. Oh. And what's your total case production? It's about 1,100 these days. Oh. Um, if you count champagne and red sparkling and all that, um, yeah, just about 1,100. Oh. And where, what markets is your wine available in? Um, virtually none. Um, we are uh, we are in distributed fairly well in the state of Maine. Okay. And and other than one client, a resort in Utah, which is a really long story you don't want to hear. But uh, so we're in one place in Utah, the state of Maine, and our tasting room. We're not even distributed in the state of California. So people just have to seek you out. Yeah, which they. Seem to do. Or not. Yeah. So. <laughs> and the name Vines on the Merry Crest. Incredibly long story. Um, it's an unusual name, I uh, admit. Uh, it has to do with a time in my life when I was just discovering wine in, in my 30s. I was very late to wine, relatively. Uh -huh. And uh, I, was, I, I jumped in with both feet as far as making wine and teaching myself how to make wine. And at some point in the middle of that whole... Uh, home winemaking experience, I, I, I was like drawn to the idea that I was going to do something like this for real and change my career and everything like that. So I knew that was many years down the line, but I was committed to that idea. So I staked out a, um, a plot of land that did not belong to me that I felt no one would care if I 
you know, decided to uh, plant a giant vineyard on, and um, and I did that. So I, I cleared this this property of the mustard weed and whatnot and brush and planted about a quarter acre of vines on... Where was it? This was on a nunnery. Um, it, it was... Uh, it, 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 the, the neighborhood I was living in at the time, um, at the very, very top of this hill um, neighborhood in, in Culver City in Southern California, uh, there's this old, uh, a Catholic woman's old folks home. So it's a, a rest home for either you're a nun, mm -hmm. you can go there and, and live out your days, or you're an incredibly wealthy Catholic woman. And um, so this is a 14 acre property in the middle of Los and Angeles. It's Mary Crest. Hence, yeah. So I planted this vineyard and never thinking that they were going to find this, this vineyard, which was, of all the things I thought of at that time, the most foolish, foolish thing, that they'd never find it. And they found it, and unfortunately, they thought it was a marijuana field, like a gigantic field of marijuana, and then so they were, they were immediately really frightened, and they called the police and very upset and all of that. And then, Cops came and figured out it was me very easily because my name was on just about every one of those vines with <laughs> the nursery tags. You know. were like, follow me, find me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, luckily, they, in, in, in retrospect, it was really lucky because if they didn't know who it was, they just would have ripped it all out, right? right? So the head, the, the, the head nun, whatever you call her, the mother superior, whatever it is, um, knew she had been there so long that she knew my family. And this is where I grew up, you know. And so she knew exactly who I was, and so I was summoned, they found me. And this long, long sort of back and forth with the nuns um, started about whether I was A, going to be arrested, or B, get to keep my vines there, uh -huh. and everything like that. And they went from, I'm, I'm really editing this down. Yeah, but, yeah. So, but it, they went from really wanting to do me harm, like put me in jail for this, because they were so upset to completely having my back and supporting me with their archdiocese and, and everything like that. So it, when, when my wife and I, I met my wife after that, but not too long after that, and we decided that we were just gonna just come up to pass them and do our thing, we, in, in tribute to them, because I wouldn't have met my wife, none of this would have happened had I not done that. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the facility is called uh, Mary Crest Manor, and mine were the vines on Mary Chris Manners of Vines and Mary Chris. And what happened to those vines? Um, most of them, other than the Merlot I planted, um, were brought here, and they they are just behind you um, in that uh, aforementioned field blend. Um, okay. I grafted over um, some. I changed a few things, but but there were many, a few hundred of them were dug up. They were actually moved three different times wow. in their lives, and so yeah, so they're. Uh, it, it, it's fun to think that there's actually vines on the Mary Crest vines at vines on the Mary Crest. <laughs> Not to confuse anyone. <laughs> yeah, but there's two different places, right? So, uh, so that's the story in a, in a very small nutshell. Well, yeah, we've got to keep it brief here because yeah. I have so many questions for you. Oh, so away. I'm curious, you said you got into wine a little late, later yes. in life. What would you say is one of your first memories relevant to wine? Um, the the comical um, gallon of uh, Gallo Hardy Burgundy in our in our family refrigerator that was never consumed by anyone uh -huh. and that sat there for 17 years as far as I could tell probably even longer so um, it was just this thing that was there you know they had to move to get to the orange juice or something <laughs> that's my really my truly my first memory of wine is like why is this in my refrigerator and um, and then. Decades later, somebody uh, was visiting, visiting my home in Los Angeles, and they left a Wine Spectator magazine. Um, and I had seen it at the airport. You know, you know, you see that, but you've never really opened it. Hadn't never had an interest to do it. And I was just sitting one Saturday afternoon and picked up this magazine, and I started reading and looking at the pictures and just going, "Holy cow! This, you know, these people know how to live." This doesn't look like the jug in my refrigerator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that pretty much sparked uh, some, you know at least bi-weekly trips to Trader Joe's just to buy wine from wherever and the buying of more magazines and just and then the buying of books on making wine and why they do what they do where they do it and all that and um, it snowballed very quickly and then I became this out of control collector guy you know well so on that note in what would you say is one of those 
one of those aha moment wines you drink? Is there a particular occasion? Maybe it was early in your drinking that kind of set you on a path. Um, or maybe it was a little more later into it. But is there yeah. an aha wine for you? I think of two. Uh -huh. one, one is I was walking my dog in that same neighborhood where the Mary Crest was. And I remember walking by this house with its garage open and these two Old, older gentlemen sitting there in, in lawn chairs and I noticed that there were carboys everywhere and barrels and things like that and, and I kind of poked my head in and, and said, you know, I'm, I'm making wine now, I'm very interested in that and, and, and they invited me over, this, this is a weird story, but they invited me over and let me taste out of their barrel and stuff like that and I remember being really, really impressed with what they were doing and that it was possible to do you know, it's like, hey, I can, if they can do this, I can do this too. <laughs> so it turns out that one of the people I was chatting with, I found uh, he became a dear friend. And it took about a couple years of knowing him to realize that I took his daughter to the prom. <laughs> and he knew that, but I didn't know. He, he knew he that I... He never connected the dots he, for he, you. <laughs> he never connected. I was in his house and I saw my picture in his... Oh my God, that's funny. Yeah. I said, that's me. He goes, I know. And so at that, that wine, kind of in that uh -huh. moment, and, uh, and the, the gentleman that owned the home uh, had actually had one of the two commercial wineries, well not two, but at least on the west side of LA in the 70s, there were two commercial wineries. One was Hank Donatoni's place, who's here now in Paso and has been forever. And the other one was this thing called Southern California Cellars or something like that, and that was the guy. He only ran it for a couple years and ran himself into the ground, but... Um, he had been a, a professional winemaker, and he's very good at what he does. So, and then I, I got somehow, and I don't even remember how, invited to a super Tuscan tasting, like a really exclusive thing at some fancy hotel in Santa Monica. I wormed my way in there or something like that. And, and tasting those wines were, was a revelation for me, and, and it just seemed like that was what I wanted to do, you know, um, that style and whatnot. So. So if we were to go into your cellar, mm -hmm. or wherever you stash your wines, yeah. um, what kind of wines would we find in your cellar? Uh, um, well, if this were 20 years ago, it would be like way too many Napa Cabernets, you know, because that's all I seemed to buy at the time. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, the occasional Rhone, you know, or, or Italian wine, but uh, some some reason I was really stuck on Napa Cabs. Now I don't, I never drink them, and not that I don't like them. I, yeah. Can't afford them for one, but um, it, it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of local wine. You know, um, I think you hear this answer a lot that uh, that there's a lot of trading that goes on, and you know, somebody will just at a festival tap you on the shoulder, and you'll see this bottle of wine come up. <laughs> you, you go, you don't even look and see who it is. You go, here you go. You know, yeah. and um, and so it's uh, I try to get out into other regions when I can if I'm traveling down to LA, you know, maybe I'll bust through Santa Barbara and buy up some wines and things like that. It, it's a, um, and then we've been buying a lot of Malbecs for some reason Ooh. from all over the country. And not that we're even particular fans of Malbecs, but I'm just noticing we've got a lot of Malbec here. And so um, I would say it's mainly California wine, but that kind of happens by osmosis. And yeah. then, and then uh, everything else is just what we might uh, just pick up along the way. But uh, I'd say it's majoritively California. And uh, have you opened anything recently that drank really well? Yes. What yes. What was it? Um, you know, my pal Sherman Thatcher, um, who I know you've interviewed, mm -hmm. uh, he gave me the, just the other day a Chanon Blanc that he did. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, kind of a rare bird around here. I don't, think there's, I don't think there's 25 acres of it planted, you know, in Paso, if, if there's that much left. And, and I really liked it. Um, and uh, the aforementioned uh, Malbecs, we've been, we were going to have a Malbec party, right? So we invite a bunch of people and include our own. We make one and we were going to have this giant Malbec party and then we didn't. Uh -huh. And so now we have all these Malbecs from all <laughs> over the world. So we've been drinking those and those have been, um, those have been very interesting. And I, uh, uh, oftentimes Argentinian Malbecs are a little tough for me. They're a little ferocious, you know. Um, so we've had a couple of French ones, and and uh, and they're and they're quite nice. I really like them. So, do you think there's a such thing as a perfect variety? Um, no, no. 
which is why we all blend wine, right? <laughs> um, I think there's some varieties here in Paso Robles that are so wholly underrepresented that really deserve more attention. Uh, one that screams out to me is Sangiovese, which um, is, it just performs incredibly well here. I mean, and better, I think, relatively to some varietals that really have a big reputation around here. So, um, but a perfect varietal, no. 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 Okay. What would you say is your opinion about wine critics and scores? I mean, you're a small little winery, so, yes. you know, that usually plays a different role for a brand like yours, but... Um, but you I, did read Wine Spectator. I, you know what, I did, but I, I, I tried not to go all the way to the back. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it has been, I think that there was a real scourge of bad taste in the 90s and 2000s, and I think it was really driven by the wine scores, you know, and, and people completely missing the point about what these high scores were getting and, and chasing that, you know what I mean? And, and therefore, I think the sweet wine thing kind of really, really kind of uh, <laughs> avalanched when that when all that happened. And, um, and I think that... that in as much as that got a lot of people into wine, sweet wine gets amateur, you know, gets new drinkers into wine a lot easier than a complex, you know, sure. food wine or something like that. In as much as it helped that, um, I think it really hurt the overall. It was like boy band wine, you know. There was a bunch of wines that were just like candy boy bands, yeah. and and you know, jazz and and real serious music kind of was left to flounder in the '87s, you know. <laughs> I'm going to guess you worked in the music business before. I, I did. <laughs> well, that'll be good because we'll play a game later. Okay. But um, as a wine drinker, I know you said you have a lot of Malbec and you mm -hmm. talked about a few things, but if you had to choose red, white, or rosé? Rosé. Hmm. Without, without even thinking about it. Wow. Yeah. Okay. It's my desert island wine. And, and I wish I had some to offer you. I, uh, <laughs> we're sold out of it. But it's the wine I take the most pride in making. Um, uh, and the, it's the most uh, challenging wine, believe it or not, that I make every year. Um, it's like, you, I don't know, you're, you're too young, but there was this fellow in Ed Sullivan that used to spin plates on sticks. You I know, remember and, that. And he'd run, and uh, at least the way we do around here, uh, rosé is plates spinning all over the, all over the place. And um, so I judge my, I have this little thing where I judge the quality of my vintage on how well I made my rosé. And that's... that's that's how seriously we take it. Wow. So. Okay, so red, white, rosé, you pick rosé. Still or sparkling? Um, either. Is that a good enough question? Good enough. Yeah. And for sparkling, champagne or somewhere else? Um, I have this rule, anything that's good, you know, it doesn't matter. It, does, it doesn't matter. Um, I think I've had some Napa, you know, sparkling wines. Letitia have had some wines that have just, mm -hmm. like, just really um, impressed me. And there's a, a couple of purveyors here in Paso that are that are starting out and doing great stuff right off the bat. So you're an equal opportunist. I am. I am. And, <laughs> and I'm really a bang for the buck guy. You know, I, I, uh, I, I'd, uh, you know, I'll pay whatever for a wine, but not always. And and yeah. so, um, so I I'll explore different things. I think the best one of the best sparkling wines I ever had was back in my amateur days um, in Los Angeles, uh, a particular wine shop was selling a Chenin, a sparkling Chenin Blanc mm -hmm. from Loire. And it was $12.99 a bottle. And I bought probably 15 cases of it or something. It was given it to wow. people and it, it was like, you've got to try this because it was, it was, it was, uh, it was kind of a really life-changing, you know, bet. It doesn't have to be you know, yeah. you don't have to play the expensive guitar to make good music. You know, it, it was just beautiful. When it comes to, I mean, you drink a variety of wines and like a variety of wines. So when it comes to food and wine pairing, do you follow any rules or do you just sort of see what you're in the mood for wine-wise and let it happen? Or, or do you follow the old rules of white wine and fish, red wine and, and meat? Or, you know, is um, there some other way to live by that? I think... Yeah, there is some other way to live by that, and and I mean, if you can get close, you know, uh, you're you're doing all right. But you know, there there's there's things that people haven't yet discovered. You know, there there are 
there are pairings that is like, hey, I didn't know, you know. Mm -hmm. We have a, um, a dessert wine that we that we make, and in particular, we've tried it with everything under the sun, and it's its most favorite thing to be paired with is a cheese course, you know. And it was like, that's not what I thought was going to happen when I made this wine, you know. So, um, we, my wife and I play a lot of a game called Guess That Wine, mm -hmm. you know, so she'll be making dinner, and I won't really know what she's making, or she won't know if I'm making dinner, or whatever. And so we we kind of take it to a point, but we don't we don't take it all that seriously. But we're not gonna we're not gonna have a tana with a with a you know a, a fillet of sole or something. <laughs> yeah. But, but um, you know, it's, but sometimes, especially if, if you're at a restaurant, you can really zero in and you know and talk to the mm -hmm. the, the psalm or whomever. Um, so it really depends. It really depends. Mm -hmm. But at home, um, we try, but we don't always hit it on on the mark, man. and it's okay. Yeah. Uh, what what do you sort of guide by just kind of mood and then and uh, um, yeah or sometimes my wife will be just in the mood for something and then that wine will dictate what we're making or how heavy it is that we're going to make it or something like that so um, it, it it's a it's a big circle you know it's like spin the wheel yeah. and and um, we drink a lot of wine at home and and there's really there's no, there's not a rhyme or reason to it. You know? We always enjoy what, it, what we do. So, for somebody who hasn't had the pleasure to taste your wines yet, mm. what do you think they're missing out on? Huh. Uh, loud music for one, because <laughs> uh, we'll always give them that. Um, I think uh, I think we have a pretty somewhat singular style here in Paso Robles. We lean. We lean on the European side of the of the line in the sand, and um, you'll you'll find I think, if, or someone will find if they drink our wines that there's a lot of salivation happening. Mm. You know, these are very mouth watering wines, and they're, they're they're not necessarily the biggest wines in Paso. I wouldn't even uh, want to get in that contest, you know. But um, but we have a real. I, I I like to say that if I. If you came in here and tried our wines, if I blindfolded you and spun you 50 times and you suddenly didn't know where you were, you might not think you're in California. And, and that to me is, is uh, I came up with a funny little thing um, that the vines on America's wines are mullet wines. They're California in the front and European in the back. <laughs> So if space aliens were to land on your property, which of your wines would you introduce them to? <laughs> uh, uh, so Mullet-wearing aliens, mullet of course. Mullet-wearing, ooh. <laughs> um, I think I would, I would introduce them to uh, a wine we make from this fuel blend I mentioned before, which no matter what I do uh, with it, uh, because there's really different ways to approach making wine out of a field blend. You mm -hmm. pick it all at once, or you can, you, you know. So um, I would point him to that wine because it, it really, no matter what, it's always our most European tasting wine. It's it's um, it's just got one of those things where if somebody gave it to me and I didn't know I was drinking it, I wouldn't guess that it was California. And then I kind of like that I like, because the wines in in, Cal in Paso are so typically Californian. I mean, they're almost quintessentially. California. The poor aliens might think that they landed in the wrong place. That's okay. They can, <laughs> they can go right across the street. And so, yeah, I, I think I would point them to that one just because it's it's such a, it's anomalous a little, you okay. know. So I know that this is a, a small family-owned business, and it's you and your wife, and I, you have a daughter and a son. And a son. Do you make them work? Uh, it doesn't. I, I do, but they don't do it. So. Okay. Um, so for you and your wife, or for you alone, have you? Do you have any rituals you have at the start of harvest? Any traditions mm. during harvest time or at the end? Um, trying to think. Like I know a buddy of mine who pours a bottle of his previous year's rosé into mm -hmm. the whatever it is that he's making and things. Yeah, like there's that. that, or there's you know growing a beard, or there's yeah. wearing certain I, socks, uh, or. <laughs> uh, I've had my share of beards that probably didn't make it all the way through, you know, uh, that just got too uncomfortable or, or something. I'm trying to think, I mean, we make wine the same way, you know, every, every year, and um, 
I, I maybe just praying that my equipment works when when I'm starting it. You know, <laughs> after nine months or whatever of uh-huh. not making wine, that everything um, will, will will turn and do its thing. Um, maybe that, but I, I can't think of a, a tradition other than we listen to a lot of music. Um, you know, there's 1,500 or so LPs in our winery and two separate sound systems. You know, whatever you want to be doing. So uh, I guess there's there's just a lot of loud sounds going on. Well, speaking of sounds, um, these are your vines. This is your property. You walk through it. Mm-hmm. Have you been known to talk to your vines? Um, or do you sing to your vines? Or do you play music for your wine? Or talk to your wine? I, I always talk to my wine. And I always play them uh, really good music. Um, as far as the vines go, I'm usually swearing at the critters more than t- <laughs> more than talking at my vines. So, um, cursing bees, birds, gophers, deer, uh, boar, um, you name it, ground squirrels. Um, so if you can call that singing, I'm, but I'm usually just yelling <laughs> at the top of my lungs. And any type of music, any particular music that the that the wine oh, seems to like more than another? Um, well, I tell you, there's there's a, there's certain uh, as I mentioned before uh, during. During harvest is when I usually play LPs, you mm-hmm. know, and, and all of the other times of the year I'm just running, you know, streaming music or, or a CD carousel or whatever like that. And so there are certain LPs that get dug out year after year, even though I try to hide them from myself so I don't play them over and over again. So there's, there's a couple of records that, uh, that my wines, maybe they're sick of them now or something like that, but uh, there's one by this Chicago band from 1967 called Odell Brown and the Organizers and it's instrumental B3 organ funk jazzy kind of hard driving uh, stuff that that um, really seems to get me in the mood to do what I have to do in there and um, and it so, better be getting the wine in the mood yeah, yeah, yeah. it seems to be they, you know so far so good <laughs> um, you were saying that you do you know every year you're making you make wine the same way every year. So in terms of vintage, do you feel that there's a lot of variation from vintage to vintage, or do you also feel that there's a lot more similarity the way making wine has a lot more similarity? It's a great question. Um, I would say the first 10, 12 years of doing this, there was, there was more similarity than the last six or eight. So, um, you know, a, a, a vintage can be going along smoothly and, you're, and you think, hey, this is going to be the greatest thing ever and so far so good. There's no rain, there's no frost and, you know, temperatures are within a certain window and all that. And then come September when you're five days from wanting to harvest and it's 115 and, and you know, so there's all these little things that can just happen in a, in a heartbeat and the, the weirdnesses seem to be happening more and more and more, you know. Um, so, yeah, the answer question is both, you know. Yeah. It, it used to be so that you know, in our first 10, 11 years, I think we had one harvest that I didn't think was all that great. And now now we've had, you know, three in the last eight or whatever. So I know that wine wasn't something you initially set out to do when you were a child. When you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? Wow, uh, that's easy. Uh, a, uh, from, uh, from six or seven to about 15 or 16, a, a professional baseball player. And then from 16 until now, a rock and roll star. So, uh-huh. um, so yeah, it's really easy. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> still super, dreaming. Yes, yeah, still dreaming. <laughs> and when you worked in the music industry, what did you do? I was a technical engineer in recording studios. So I was. Uh, if people don't know what that is. I was a um, the doctor of recording studios. So if there was a problem. They, I was called if there was a studio to be built or designed. I was called if somebody didn't know how to work a certain piece of equipment or something wasn't going right in a session. I was called in. So I was there was always a, a usually a fire when when I'm around, you know, and I'm the guy putting out the fire. And that's why, which we'll talk about later, visiting here, your tasting room is soundproof like a recording studio. It is. It is. We, we built this this uh, this room. Uh, Alice and I are sitting in a, in a beautiful room here that we had so much time to think about it um, that uh, to get it approved and save the money to build it actually that 
um, we built it as a recording studio. So, and, and, and I'm convinced that if it said recording studio on the outside, it would be the best recording studio in the county. So we use vintage preamps and vintage microphones and studio quality microphones. And so when we have, uh, we have shows, concerts here, which uh, happen two, three times a year, um, we record them in high definition, multi-track, and we, uh, we released a CD um, last year of a, a five-year snapshot of, of people who've played here. And we invite all our favorite artists in the world. We have, we've had people from all over the world playing. And uh, as you were telling me before, if you join the wine club, you get CDs. Yeah, yeah, that, that, uh, yeah. It, it's weird because this is this 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 wine club we're shipping out right now is the first year we we uh, the first shipment we've not sending a CD because CDs are going right. Going you more. get music. You, you get, get playlist. Music, yeah. Yeah. So for, 14, <laughs> for fourteen years, you got a CD. And, um, in your wine club box, and then now we're um, we're doing the same exact format, but instead of a CD, it's a private Spotify playlist that we give you the link to, and so that's how it goes. So I was going to ask you, when you're not making wine, what do you do in your free time? But I'm going to guess music is what you do in your free time. Yeah, I listen. <laughs> I listen. Um, you know, uh, all my friends are in bands or DJs or whatever, um, and. Uh, yeah, I listen to music I, when I'm in, in the vineyard. I got an iPod and a headphone, so I, I average, you know, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 hours of music a day on most days. And so I, I listen to a lot of music. And so I, I'm very thirsty for music. Huh. Um, it would be probably too much to ask you who your favorite singer or artist is. Wow, it would, that, that's really hard. Um, <laughs> you know, of all time, you know. Um, Do you have one of all Yeah, time? you know, there's, uh, I mean, we have, to, uh, we have to say the Beatles, and we, and we have to acknowledge Buddy Holly, and then um, there's bands uh, like NRBQ, who I adore, um, seen them more times than I can think of, um, the Love and Spoonful, Love the band Love. Um, there's just so many that I just I just marvel at how great they are. Genesis, another early Genesis, another one that um, which is kind of surprising to some people based on my other yeah. ta tastes that I like this band, but I, I adore that band. So, when you're planning a romantic evening for you and your wife, what sort of wines do you open up for that evening? Ah. If it's super romantic, uh, it's always just up to my wife. Um, uh, but um, bubbles are a really lovely way to start. Uh -huh. um, and uh, is it the bubbles we're drinking now? Um, it might be. Um, okay. This this is a brand new release for us, and um, that'll do nicely. That's that's creamy and, and sexy right there. And this is um, the grapes are Grenache, that's, Cunois, and in Vignet, but in the in the uh, in the opposite order. So Vignet dominant, Grenache, and Cunois. Ooh. Yum. I had to just, you know, wet my palate a little so I can keep going here. Um, when you think back um, in your career and everything you've done, is there a piece of advice that has kind of carried you through or that you try to live by? Um, yes. Yes, and there's two. Um, one, one given to me by that gentleman in that garage that I mentioned before. When I was just beginning... And I had told him what I had done. I thought I had messed something up pretty good. And, and he said to me, and this, this rings in my head. It's amazing how often I think of what he said to me. But he told me not to worry about what I'd done. And he said, wine is a very forgiving thing. And it is. You know, if you care for it, and it... it, it, it he, he, never, he, ne he wasn't intimating that we should just treat it like hell or whatever like that, but... There's if 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 you care, it will care back, you know, and, and it's just it will forgive you, um, and that that's always been really important. In because I, I experiment a lot, and I really get out over, you know, I walk the tightrope um, in our style of wine. You know, I'm, I'm really I work in a really dangerous area, you know, higher acid wines and, and things like that, and and so sometimes you you know you go a little far or whatever. And another one. Uh, was when we first moved here, I was sitting next to this uh, well-known fellow called Terry Hogue. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was telling him that we were just starting out. And, he, you know, he, he, was, he wasn't all that long into the process either, but he certainly got here before we did. And he said to me, 
Before you make your very first bottle of wine, you have to know where you're going to sell it before you make it. <laughs> and of course, I didn't listen to him. <laughs> Um, but it is uh, no truer words have ever you know you can make all the wine you want but you gotta you, sell it you gotta be able you gotta know how and where you're gonna sell it and um, or else you're you're gonna give it away or, or it's 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 a bad scene you know yeah so it's really easy to make wine it's really hard to sell wine mm -hmm. if you could offer a piece of advice to our listeners what would you want to share ah um, who are interested in getting into the wine business or just... No, drinkers. Oh, oh I see. Okay. Um, you know, get... buy wine to help that winery yeah. who needs someone to That's sell. Right. <laughs> you know, um, th there's people that come into our tasting room that... that I, I, we always ask people what brought you to our winery because we're, we're so hidden and we're kind of just... We're not on any particular radar, so to speak. You know, we're not mm -hmm. in this... The, the scores or anything like that and we're not you know we just kind of we're not in any club if you will mm -hmm. so we always ask people who finally make their way to our place it's like what what brought you here and they say well we like to go to a new a couple new places every time we come and I always applaud that you know and um, I, I, I would my advice would be you know just don't go to the same places you go to or you know if you can buy their wine in the supermarket or Costco or whatever go somewhere else or and and ask people behind the bar you know where should I go what do you like you know why do you like them and just try and discover um, people who are really uh, you know doing it themselves you know there's there's a lot of people w making wine that they don't touch their wine you know they, they don't have their hands on it and nobody touches my wine with me no right. one and so um, that that would be interesting to me if I think if I were on the other side of the counter Who's the guy that you know looks like he was fighting with his wine? Not, you know. uh, so I guess, I guess that just explore and and ask questions and 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 just don't buy what you like all the time at the at the store. Try something from you know Hungary or or some just yeah. just branch out. When you look back at um, your career, what would you say is one of your proudest achievements to date? Uh, that I'm still married. Yeah. <laughs> I think that one, um, <laughs> running a business with your spouse and, and running and basically starting a business from nothing, from next to nothing, because we didn't, you know, uh, there was no winery here, there was, there was trees and whatnot, so we, we started from less than zero. Um, I think, I think in just surviving uh, in this business in, in, an, in a really crowded, let's just say race, mm -hmm. if you will, and sticking to my guns stylistically and not chasing a bunny down a hole as far as like I want to get a good score so I'm going to make a big fat jammy thing or, or whatever mm -hmm. um, and so I just think uh, believing in myself and and um, knowing or feeling that what I had to say meant something you know, I guess like that. so um, complete the sentence for me a table without wine is like? Uh, there better be some beer around. Uh, <laughs> but I, I would say it is a puzzle missing a piece, you know? Um, oh, I like that. Yeah. So you can, you know, when, you know, we've been doing puzzles of late and uh, we might buy one at a thrift store and it, you know, we're like, oh my God, there's a, there's a piece missing. And it's just the Terrible. worst. It's just the worst. So, so uh, that's a I table without say, wine. I would say. I like it's, that. Okay. Um, if you imagine a scenario where you're, it's a restaurant and a dinner table and there are people sitting around it and, and the paparazzi outside are really excited because someone important is sitting at that table uh, and they're drinking your wine, who would you want that person to be? Uh, um, I would, can it be two people? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, it's a dinner table. Okay. <laughs> Um, I would say Bach and Buddy Holly. That's the, those are those are I, when I think That's about an interesting it, combo. Yeah, <laughs> um, revelatory people, and you know uh, Buddy because he died so young and he had so much influence mm -hmm. uh, that he never knew he did right. And Bach just because 
I just want to hear what he sounds like when he talks, you know, like <laughs> what, what would he say if I said hello, you know. Um, so I didn't. I wouldn't even really care if they liked my wine or not. I'm, I doubt Buddy Holly would, would, was a wine kid, you know, <laughs> at 22. Oh, well, you but never know. Never know. But uh, yeah, you never know. Maybe I'm selling him short. But yeah. I think I think those two gentlemen, just because I, I think about them a lot. Yeah. Very cool. So you mentioned that you are a big rosé drinker, and rosé is your desert island wine. But if you were allowed to take three wines to a deserted island. What three wines would you take? Okay. And is and when it comes to rosé, is there a specific one? Um, I, I I love rosé because it's so malleable. You know, the, there's so many styles that are good. Um, so I would, you know, there, there's some. The, I, I could be happy just having all French rosé, but um, there are uh, American producers. There's a bloke up up north that does a rosé of Sangiovese. You know, he wins the San Francisco Chronicle every year with this, every year with this, with this rosé of Sangiovese, and uh, and it's really he's really deserving of. I forget even who it is because uh-huh. it's been a while, but um, so I would say rosé from around the world. Okay. Um, I would say a super uh, a, a super Tuscan wine, okay. without a doubt, and a mildly aged Napa Cab, maybe a six eight year old. Napa Cab, somebody like yeah. a, a Chimus or, or something, or Chateau Montalena. There, Chateau Montalena, in a good vintage, eight years on it or so. I'll take that. Okay. Now we always play a fun game at the end of this, where we pair wine and music. This is going to be so easy for you that normally I'm like three wines and like it's pulling teeth, but with you, let's let's see how. F- let's do like a fast round here. I'll throw out wines, wines based on what you've talked about or. You know, and you tell me what you'd want to be drinking with it or what listening to, what it kind of conjures for you. Okay. So let's start with um, uh, let's start with that um, Chateau Montalena. Oh, um, something uh, Miles Davis, uh, something um, mid period, you know, kind of blue uh, era, okay. nothing too experimental, but uh, silky, dark, brooding music. Okay. Super Tuscan. Um, that, that gets a little, a uh, little more in the harder edge stuff. I would say um, maybe live stones, live. You know, some some Mick Taylor era stones, um, sloppy on drugs. You know. Okay. That, uh, rose, but how about Provence rose? Oh gosh, um, Joni Mitchell on a, on a you know out, out, outside singing to me in person. And R- Rosé of Sangiovese from the guy oh, you mentioned? North. Um, how about... How about... I'll tell you what. There's a, there's a gentleman that um, I got introduced to by a friend of mine who gave me a bunch of his CD. He burned a bunch of CDs and I said, I think you're going to love this guy. And when somebody does that to me, it's usually a disaster, right? <laughs> so this was very on when our winery was when our winery was first built. And um, I, I have a 300 CD changer. Mm-hmm. And so I just shoved all these CDs in that changer and I didn't really pay, pay attention to where I put them. And so uh, when I was making wine that year, whenever one of these CDs would finally come around and it would, I would stop in my tracks and I would listen and I didn't know who it was, I couldn't figure out, is that mine? Like, what is that? And I, and I would run in and look at the CD player and look at the number of the CD of 300 mm-hmm. and then what track it was, and I'd write it down. And I had this, I collected this list, and I finally broke open the CD player and pulled out these, these CDs, and I found out it was all the same guy. And um, I, sub- I subsequently wrote to this person, and he did one of these CDs for us, and then he came to play here. He's from Portland. Yeah. He was a very, he was, best, he was best friends with Elliot Smith, and his name is Pete Krebs. And he's a very important guy around here because um, for a very, very long time, it was his music that was just constantly in our, in our winery. So uh, an oddball answer would be Pete Krebs. Okay. Now, what about your rosé? I haven't tasted it, but uh, you talked that it is sort of your pride and joy. So your rosé. My rosé would have to be... Uh, and your rosé is made with what grapes? It's a, a GSM, okay. and, um, but there's usually a little Z in it also. Um, and Z is a very important part of, uh, 
of that rosé. Um, Z gets a bad rap for you know for obvious reasons as far as pink goes, but it's an actually an incredible um, uh, element of rosé. So. Um, my own rosé would have to be with my favorite band because my own rosé is my favorite. Um, so I would think uh, uh, NRBQ uh, at Yankee Stadium album uh, 1977, um, and I could be I could be really happy with that. Okay, um, sitting here with a couple wines in front of me, your Spanish bombs. Yeah, what what, what music will we listen yeah. to? Yeah. Um, I would think uh, maybe the Buena Vista, even though they're Cuban, uh, how about the, <laughs> the Buena Vista Social Club? Okay. Uh, because there is a very Latinness to that wine. And, and so what? What is the variety makeup of that, and uh, what would you play with that? Um, well, that is a Miles a tribute to Miles. Okay. So Spanish Bombs, uh, backtracking, is a tribute to The Clash. That's a song off of London Calling, okay. their, their most revered record. So What is the opening track of Kind of Blue, and my daughter was born to that album. Um, she took a long time to come out, so we, <laughs> we heard Kind of Blue like, you know, 80 times or something. Um, so uh, I would say if you're not listening to Miles while you're listening to So What, uh, where you're drinking So What, then you're out of your mind. So maybe Coltrane. <laughs> okay. So we'll move over to Coltrane. And then last but not least, the sparkling wine that we're drinking. Uh-huh. Um, which again is Viognier with Cunoa and Grenache. Yes. What would I listen to with our sparkling wine? Um, how about Cass Elliot? Cass Elliot, who, whose voice just sends me places. Mom, also known as Mama Cass. Yes. Um, she, uh, she, her voice just makes me happy, and this wine makes me happy. So um, it, 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 she sends me places. So. I love it. We could keep doing this, but <laughs> got to watch our time. And, as um, much as you want. As, <laughs> so I have um, two more quick, one more quick question for you, which is when you think about um, traveling for wine, mm-hmm. what's one place at the top of your bucket list that you are like, that's where I want to go explore? It's easy. Uh, New Zealand. New Zealand. And I think you get that answer a lot. Um, a, because it's just so far away and hard to get to. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I really, uh, the wines, I've really enjoyed wines from New Zealand and they have their, their singularity, you know, that you can kind of tell they're from there. And, and um, but really, I just want to see it. I just want to, you know, I want to go. Um, it's probably one of the most beautiful places in the world. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't know, but I can imagine. I've been to some really beautiful places and, um, but that's not one of them. So yeah. I, I think without a doubt, New Zealand. Um, well, yeah. and, and my family's from Chile. Uh, my mom and dad were from Chile, and I've done a little bit of exploring Chile, but I'd really like to go back there and, and dig in harder and, and see. Uh, well, as I look out the window here, it's pretty beautiful here, too, in Paso Robles. And for others who may want to come here for the first time or to repeat a visit back to Paso Robles but may not have found finds on the Mary Crest yet, yes. um, where can people find you and um, how can they visit you? Okay. Great question. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> um, well, uh, we, have a, we have a website that's pretty well-informed and... Um, uh, and we, we kind of hide. You don't see us off the road until you can't really see us until you're here. Mm-hmm. So we get very little, hey, what's that? You know, um, but there is a winery or a tasting room, for that matter, uh, directly across the street from, much with, from us, which is very easy to find, which is called Chronic Cellars. So um, any map of Paso will have vines on the Mary Crest on it. But if you're just driving down the road and you see Chronic Cellars, we are 100 feet across the street. Great. But um, visit our website or give us a call. Um, we are uh, we are open Thursday, well Thursday through Monday, um, but we can always open up for somebody if they call us because we live seventy five feet away from our tasting room. So <laughs> it's convenient. really it's really not all that hard. And, uh, so by appointment seven days a week. Uh, yeah, yeah, or, or we're open eleven to five Thursday through through uh, Monday. So. Um, that's, and, that's enough. Yeah, yeah. And join the wine club and you'll get playlists of music. So it's a win-win all the way around. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really important. My, my joke is that wine is just an excuse to launder music. And so um, we, uh, it, it is really beautiful. Everything, we try to do 
or, or touch everything that's beautiful. So our, our, our tasting room is, is beautiful. The music that we play and that we have here live and whatnot is beautiful. And we hope our, you think our wines are beautiful. We love food and we just, we just like to have a good time. Well, then I'm going to tell people, get out here to pass our list to Vines on the Merry Crest. And Victor, thank you for joining us today. And I will say cheers and we'll do a little cheers. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.